Welcome to Human Rights Education Now, a podcast series from Human Rights Educators USA. I'm your host, Bill Fernikes, a member of the National Steering Committee of HRE USA, a collaborative network to learn, teach, organize, advocate, and innovate for human rights education in the United States. This podcast aims to raise awareness about human rights education and invites listeners to engage with the worldwide movement to make human rights education a core focus of educational programs from preschool through higher education and in both non-formal and informal community educational settings. Today's program is a conversation with Lena Lenberg, a grade six humanities teacher at Presidio Hill School in San Francisco, California, and a leading scholar on the genocide of Uyghurs in China. In this episode, Lena discusses the origins of her interest in human rights and human rights education, how she integrates human rights content and strategies within her daily teaching, her graduate work at the University of San Francisco with a focus on the Uyghur genocide, and how her work at the International Journal of Human Rights Education has influenced her teaching and scholarship. Well, it's truly a pleasure to be talking with Lena Lenberg who is a colleague of mine in Human Rights Educators USA and a longtime human rights educator. How are you today, Lena? Uh, Doing well. Thank you so much, Bill. I'm really honored to be a part of this. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to have you here. So, Lena, tell us first how you became interested in human rights issues and subsequently in practicing human rights education. Well, I was born in Russia, and so I think my story starts, you know, in my childhood. So I was born in Russia, and my family is Jewish. And I've grown up from my earliest memories with stories of discrimination and learned early on about Russian pogroms and the Holocaust, as well as anti-Semitism, which my family members experienced directly. And when we emigrated to the U.S., I was four years old. And my parents uh, were given three days to gather their belongings, give up their jobs in their apartment, and say goodbye to their family members before being escorted to the airport. Um, And when we arrived to the U.S., we didn't speak English. And I quickly learned that our culture was different from where we had arrived. And I think as a child, I became sensitive to all sorts of different social dynamics. And I realized in retrospect that that really helped me to become a compassionate person, uh, which I think kind of primed me for for this work, which I engaged in later on as I became an adult. Um, And I didn't actually learn about the notion of human rights proper until I was an adult. And uh, that's something that actually really drives me to teach human rights education to my kids, because I sometimes imagine how much I could have done if I had learned all of this sooner. And, um, you know, I've seen that youth are extremely capable and driven, uh, but we'll get uh, more into that later. Um, So actually, I studied zoology as an undergrad in college, because I've always been interested in animals and the environment. And after college, I did an internship at the Grand Canyon, the Grand Canyon National Park, and uh, they had me doing environmental education. And so it was after that experience that I actually became a teacher. So when I was in the Grand Canyon, I loved the process of learning things and thinking about how to share them with people in a way that was digestible um, and that would also kind of activate their curiosity and motivate them to do something. So I went back to school and got my teaching credential, and then I started teaching as a biology and life sciences teacher. And my focus was really on conservation and environmental education. And initially, I think I was much more concerned with the rights of animals than than I was of humans. But um, then I started working at an international school in San Francisco, where I met people from all over the world. And I also started to spend my summers traveling and participating in volunteer projects, both locally and globally. And the more people I met and the more ideas and cultures I became exposed to, the more I really saw clearly our common humanity as people. And I started to pay attention to things in a new way. And I also became aware of inequities uh, and discrimination in, in multiple forms. And I started to consider my own positionality. And I just felt obliged to do something. And it turned out that my something thing was going to be education. And I think of myself still today as an educator activist. So I want to go back to this idea of immigration. When you and your parents came here from the Soviet Union, what year was that? 
1976. So that was during the time when the Soviet Union was imposing an immigration, quote, tax on Jews who wanted to leave, mm-hmm. like Anatoly Sharansky and other people, correct? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. So how do you feel the um, process of being an immigrant and actually being seeking an exile mm-hmm. has shaped some of your ideas about human rights? Yeah, I I think just having that sort of acute awareness of difference is really, as I said, what primed me to do this work. You know, I I understood like linguistic differences early on, religious differences early on, cultural differences in terms of food and and traditions and things early on. And uh, because of the time that we emigrated, there was a lot, you know, it was during the Cold War. um, And so during that period, there was a lot of um, bias against Russians. And so um, I heard things like, you know, are you a commie while I was growing up? You know, of course, I didn't really understand what this meant. We actually had for years an FBI agent come to our house to interview my dad, to interrogate my dad, who was working as an engineer at the time. So I saw these things. And I think um, I really came to see that (laughs) there were patterns of interactions and behaviors that were different in different contexts. And uh, eventually I came to understand that those were because of cultural linguistic differences and biases associated with them. And so, again, I think developing this understanding early on and seeing it and seeing the struggles of my parents uh, really primed me to engage in the work of advocating for rights for all people and respecting differences um, and valuing and even celebrating differences. And that's something that very much is part of my work still today. So what have you done to actually integrate it in your daily teaching? What's some of the challenges you face in doing that? Well, um, So I, at the international school that I mentioned earlier, I uh, gradually took on more responsibility at that school and ended up as an administrator. And it was around that time that I actually started the human rights club at the school. It was a high school, so it was open to ninth through 12th graders. And we talked about human rights in various contexts. We participated in volunteer projects in the local community. Um, I also worked to integrate human rights and social justice into the school curriculum as a whole by working with teachers, um, continued also community service with the kids. And you know, for me, human rights education has never really been about the official HRE documents, although I do teach kids about the UDHR, um, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, other international conventions to my graduate students who I now also teach. Um, For me, it's always been more about emphasizing our common humanity and being clear about the fact that human rights are not selective. They are for everyone um, because, of course, no one is any less human than anyone else. And um, this ties into teaching in such a way that respects human rights in the classroom and the school environment as a whole. So I think human rights education for me goes beyond Um, content, but really creating an environment within which people feel respected and seen and heard and empowered. And, uh, you know, I try to recognize and dismantle hierarchies in my learning environments, which I feel is part of human rights education also. So I always prefer to be called by my first name um, with all levels of my students. And, you know, I'm vulnerable with my students. I share things with my students, um, which encourages them in turn, I think, to be vulnerable. And I've seen that that is where genuine learning and growth can take place, where people feel safe, where they're open, you know, open to learning, open to each other, open to multiple perspectives, um, also open to discomfort as a natural part of the process of growth. And I always emphasize brave spaces, you know, pushing beyond just a safe space, but a brave space. And I talk a lot about being an upstander and having the courage to use your voice. And in my current school, which is a middle school, I teach sixth grade humanities, and I also run a social justice club with the kids. And in my humanities classes, I've tried to decolonize education. So that's a part of my human rights education that in recent years I've become more interested in. Um, So I'm really trying to center indigenous histories and perspectives. And I'm intentionally including historically marginalized groups and women and queer voices. And I've also become 
increasingly interested in African studies. Um, and I realized how much there is to learn from the incredible diversity and in histories of the continent, including those of resistance and liberation. Um, so I try to bring all these things into my classes and in the social justice club in the middle school where I work, the kids organize various drives and they go out into the city, they do volunteer projects, and they've been especially concerned with unhoused families in San Francisco in recent years. And um, they've collected donations, they volunteer their time at local organizations, with work with families in need. They've also done things like organizing a menstrual products drive, both to supply these expensive products to people in need and also to diffuse the stigma and embarrassment around menstruation. And, you know, for middle school kids, <laughs> this is this is critical work that they're doing. Um, and I'm sure you're aware that, you know, the lack of menstrual products globally um, contributes to girls around the world dropping out of school, you know, not continuing their education and they miss school every month, they fall behind, they can't pass exams and they can't then continue. Um, and, you know, this is all completely preventable. So these are the sorts of projects that I try to facilitate with the students with both a global and a local focus so that they can really think about human beings in different contexts and in concrete real life situations and how they, you know, my students can actively be engaged in supporting different communities through education, through resources, um, and through things like, you know, diffusing stigmas around around various issues. And I certainly have encountered some challenges over the years. I've been a teacher for more than 20 years now. I guess I'm, I'm nearing 25 years of being a teacher. Um, and I think most of the challenges I've encountered have not been from kids. It's uh, typically the adults who feel some discomfort or even fear around teaching related to human rights. Um, and I think, you know, we've seen this, especially in recent months in our society. And I think um, a large part of the problem is that people still don't really know what human rights education is. And so I think that's a part of our work as human rights educators to continue to talk about what human rights education is. And I think people are doing work that could fall within the realm of human rights education, but they don't see it as such or, or haven't learned that it could be part of human rights education. So I think education around human rights education is also really necessary for us to continue the work. Well, that's an interesting uh, idea that the fact is that we know from survey data that most Americans don't have any idea what the Universal Declaration is. But at the same time, uh, you had mentioned before that content is not the only focus. So you are also interested in the affective dimension and in the idea of having students become civically engaged. How do you yes. work on developing those two aspects, the affective dimension and then that engagement piece? Well, I find that youth are naturally inclined to engage in this work. I have found that they want to learn about what's going on in the world. They want to feel like they have some sense of power so that they can contribute to real life issues. So I feel like the kids are ready. It's really the adults who are teaching them, I think, that um, perhaps need some support, some training and um skills to build confidence to engage the kids in this kind of work. So I, I've found consistently again for, you know, I guess some decades now that kids really love to learn about what is happening in their world. And again, as I mentioned earlier, I think sometimes the adults are maybe not entirely comfortable or confident bringing um, difficult topics or challenging uh, material or maybe even contentious material into their classes. And um, so for me, I've been fortunate to work in learning environments where I've had a lot of freedom to bring in the things that I feel are important. So um, as an educator, personally, I feel like I've been really lucky in that regard. But I know a lot of people don't have that same sort of luxury or freedom. And so um, this gets into, I think, looking at systems <laughs> and how we can change things within educational systems and teacher training programs and, and districts and things in order to support human rights education as a whole because the kids are ready. But you also teach at graduate level. So what is the mindset of the students you get at the, in graduate student programs? Well, I'm at uh, the University of San Francisco in the Department of International and Multicultural Education, which has a program already in human rights education. Education. So there's a master's in human rights education, and then the doc students can choose to have a concentration in human rights education. So 
I have found that my graduate students are already ready. You know, they're engaged. They are expecting, in fact, to learn about human rights and connect things to the world in a real way. And um, the class that I teach at USF is uh, international human rights law and advocacy with a focus on genocide. And I'll get into that a little bit later when we talk more about genocide studies. But I found that, you know, my students came in um, really wanting to learn about some of these things that have happened in the world historically and also learn the related human rights conventions and um, how to apply those. <laughs> you know, they exist. And so, you know, learning about them and then learning how to apply them, I think, is a critical part of this work. And, and so, I, yeah, I, I, again, feel very fortunate that the students that I've had have already come in with a mindset where they want to engage in this work. They want to go out into the world and do something with the knowledge that they gain. So your graduate work at the University of San Francisco focused on the genocide of the Uyghur population in China and in other parts of the world. So why did you select that topic and how did you actually uh, engage in the research? What was the path? Mm -hmm. Well, the first Uyghurs actually that I ever met were at the international school that I was talking about where I used to work in San Francisco. And I had been at the school for many years. We had a large Chinese student population. I actually have traveled to China many, many times. And in, in 2015, these Uyghur brothers showed up at our school with Chinese passports, but you know they spoke a different language. They didn't look like the other Chinese students I had met. Their mother was wearing a headscarf, you know, and I just had no idea prior to that that there was this ethnic group in China that was Muslim and that was in this area that they refer to as East Turkestan, which China calls Xinjiang. And so, meeting these brothers was the first time that I learned about Uyghurs, and I was just interested. I was interested in their culture. I was interested in learning. About their traditions. And so I got to know them. I got to know some of their family members. I got to know some of the Uyghur community members um, that helped them come to the Bay Area. And just over time, over a period of months, and then it turned into years, uh, as I established trust with them and within the community, I started to hear other stories. And I started to hear stories about their relatives who were taken uh, to prison. I, I heard about um, a woman's father who died in prison and his body was not uh, returned to the family. I heard about generations of discrimination that um, Uyghurs directly experienced outright. It was, you know, not a secret. And so I started hearing these stories and again, wondering why I had never heard <laughs> about these people or any of these stories before. And my very first semester in my doc program at the University of San Francisco, I did an oral history project with a Uyghur community member. And it was really the then um, that things turned. The things that this community member shared with me were very eye-opening, uh, deeply personal, and very concerning. And so after that, I decided that I would start conducting my own research just to learn more. Um, and so that was back in 2016 when I did the oral history project. And in 2017, the repression of Uyghurs reached um, its peak, the really high level int intensity in 2017, which was also the year that information began to emerge publicly about this vast network of concentration camps that had been built in Xinjiang or East Turkestan and the mass disappearance of Uyghurs into the camps. And so um, I remained in close contact with Uyghur community members while I was doing my own research. Research. And then in 2018, they actually requested that we do a public education program at the University of San Francisco because their own relatives had disappeared into the camps. And so in 2018, we did a public education program just talking about what was going on. And at that point, I was calling it ethnic cleansing. That was before I even realized it was a genocide. Um, and, and so again, information just continued to come out. I was following things very closely. And at that point, I decided this is what I was going to focus on for my dissertation. And even within my department, you know, human rights educators, activists, people had never heard of Uyghurs before. No one really knew what was going on. And so I felt that it was all the more critical to bring this into, you know, sort of more mainstream discourse. Um, and so in my research itself, 
Um, I just, you know, scoured publicly available information, mainstream media, academic work, which was pretty limited at the time, but, you know, whatever I could find that was that had been written about the Uyghurs in different journals. Um, I also examined an online database, which um, somebody in Europe started, which had thousands of records detailing uh, what information was available about people who had disappeared into the camps. Um, and then I, at the same time, was interviewing Uyghur community members and all all of this, you know, made it abundantly clear that there was a genocide taking place. And then finally, in 2021, our country declared that it was a genocide. Um, and then several other countries have since declared that it was a genocide. And while I was writing my dissertation itself in 20 in the 2020-21 period, I was uh, closely also following a, a tribunal that was happening in the UK, the Uyghur Tribunal, um, to investigate these ongoing atrocities in East Turkestan. And hours of testimony were provided by scholars, by human rights attorneys, NGO representatives, as well as Uyghur diaspora members, including survivors from the camps, people who worked in the camps, direct witnesses. And um, in 2021, on December 9th, 2021, the tribunal determined that China was committing genocide, crimes against humanity, um, and torture against Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities in Xinjiang or East Turkestan. And, you know, to date, we're now in 2024, uh, very little has been done to stop the Uyghur genocide. So this is an issue that I'm still very actively working on. So I teach about this issue, and then I separately um, am an advocate uh, within the Bay Area and, and California as a whole, and I'll talk about that a bit more later. Is there a network of activists like yourself that publish and do other activities that try to generate a sense of solidarity regarding this? There is a small handful <laughs> globally. Um, you know, there aren't too many people that are writing about it. There again, yeah, there's a small handful of scholars, and and I've read all their work. I cited them when I when I was doing my dissertation. They continue also to publish. Um, and then there are a number of Uyghurs in the diaspora who actually have been at the forefront of this movement of advocating for recognition of the Uyghur genocide, but for them it's really risky. And so there's sort of a designated set of people who publicly show their faces and speak out about it. There are now a number of Uyghur organizations, advocacy organizations, who are also trying to raise awareness, trying to get people to advocate for recognition of the genocide and, of course, to stop uh, the genocide. But it's still pretty limited. And um, for Uyghurs themselves, there's this now very well-documented campaign of mass transnational repression. And so, again, it's risky for them because they are threatened. You know, if you continue to speak out, you're not going to see your mother ever again. If you continue to speak out, you can say goodbye to your family members. These kinds of things have been happening for years. Um, so it's a pretty small group that is advocating for recognition of this genocide, but but an active group. Right. And what's interesting to me is how little presence this has in the mainstream media, whether it's on cable news, whether it's on streaming media or, you know, big platforms like The New York Times or The Washington Post. These are this is not a front page story anymore, it seems. Yes. That's right. And I've even heard uh, in recent months in particular, um, a lot of denial of the Uyghur genocide. And so that's, of course, very concerning, too. And so right now, I think people are redoubling their efforts to continue to really advocate for recognition of this genocide, which is now entering you know, the Uyghurs say that it started as early as 2014, but officially, publicly in 2017 is when the news started to emerge. But, you know, in any case, it's been years and very little has happened to stop the Uyghur genocide. Right. So I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about one of your other dimensions, which is that you have worked at the International Journal of Human Rights Education. And mm -hmm. has that done or contributed to your work in the field? Well, it's just been such an honor reading and editing different scholars' work before publication. I felt like I had sort of a secret view into the work uh, before it became, you know, internationally available. And so, of course, I've learned directly from their work. Um, but I've also really working in the journal helped me to think about scholarship in a whole new way. And this is, I have to say, largely thanks to Dr. Monisha Bajaj, who's the editor in chief um, and uh, one of my mentors. And uh, we, in working in the journal, completed several 
several themed issues, which I found to be particularly interesting. And one of them was on indigenous women in research. And it was a global conversations on indigeneity and rights and education. We also did an issue on decolonial human rights and peace education. And um, we did one on human rights education and black liberation, which we all felt was particularly critical um, in that moment after the murder of George Floyd, of course. And that remains one of the most downloaded issues that we did. And it was really an honor for me to be included in that project. And, and I'd say that one of the most important things working on the journal, um, it, it really trained me to consider whose voices are included and whose are not, whatever it is I'm reading and teaching. Um, and also to be aware of whose voices are typically privileged while others are excluded or silenced. And this is something I actually even teach my sixth graders, you know, and uh, of course, graduate students are aware of this too. But I think this kind of critical consciousness needs to and can start really early, just, again, centering voices and paying attention to whose voices are privileged and whose are not or whose are just silenced. So in your work, the journal, do you actually select works that you want to publish based on the review? Or is it a team effort? It's a team effort. Yeah, I actually, um, I stepped down from the journal this year to work on other projects. So now I'm on the editorial board of the journal. So I'm not as directly involved in the looking at the submissions. But um, when I was involved, it was definitely a team effort, you know, led by Dr. Monisha Bajaj, but a lot of conversation about, you know, intentions and what are our goals <clears throat> pardon me, um, you know, in terms of publication, what sort of information are we trying to share? What do we want to center? So yeah, a lot of conversation um, as a group about that. And again, it's uh, really been such an honor for me to participate in that process. And I've learned a tremendous amount, not just from the content, but in terms of how to look at things and in the larger frame of who who is contributing and how are they being valued. Right, because uh, academic journals, of course, are a platform for people who want to advance their careers, but it's also a place where you can publicize and, and share ideas that people might not necessarily hear about. Yeah, and one thing that I really appreciate about the International Journal of Human Rights Education also is that it's not just um, academic pieces of research. There's also a notes from the field section, and I believe that that was created exactly for the intention that you're talking about, you know, to bring in different perspectives on different issues that may not actually even be a research article, but just from experiences in the field and how can we learn from each other from having these different kinds of experiences in different global and local contexts. Thanks for listening to Human Rights Education Now. Our next episode concludes our conversation with Lena Lenberg, a sixth grade humanities teacher at Presidio Hill School in San Francisco, California. You can find additional information about this podcast series at www.hreusa.org. Each episode is available on the HRE USA podcast page, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Pocket Casts, Player FM, and Deezer. You can also download each episode as an MP3 file. If you have questions or comments about this podcast, send them to Christy at HREUSA.org. That's K-R-I-S-T-I at HREUSA.org. Our podcast team includes producer and editor Bill Fernickes, executive producer Christy Redalius palmer editor Elizabeth Schwab, sound designer and project manager Sabrina Sanchez, and production coordinator Jasmine Chizu Gota. Human Rights Education Now is a production of Human Rights Educators USA, a project of the Center for Transformative Action in Ithaca, New York.